Agrinusha Korja is Misha Paula Kunigan. Welcome to the second day of IST Africa 2022. And um, today is primarily focused around e health, which is obviously something of critical interest across the continent. And this morning's session, we're starting with presentations from Kenya, from Norway, Tunisia, and Malawi, and um, focusing around M health enablers and inhibitors in rural poor settings, assessing strategic priority factors in e-health policies of four African countries, strategic partnerships in e-health in low and middle income countries in Africa, and finally community of practice in practice, successful implementation of integrated community health information systems. So our first presentation, M-Health enablers and inhibitors in rural and poor settings from Kenya. Okay, you have to do the sound thing. I don't care. Share the sound. Start again. Optimize for a video clip. Start again. I'm James Njenga, both affiliated to the Department of Information Systems. I do want to do the recording again. No, just... South Africa, the European Commission, the African Union Commission, the IST Africa 2022 Organizing Committee, and my fellow participants at the conference for this opportunity to present my research study. The authors of this paper are Anuradha Koda and James Njenga, both affiliated to the Department of Information Systems at the University of the Western Cape, South Africa. The presenter for today is Anuradha Koda, who has a vast teaching experience in the field of information systems and is currently an e-learning advisor both for academic institutions as well as corporates who wish to build learning capacity within their organizations. This presentation is focused on mHealth, specifically on assessing the factors that could motivate adoption of mobile phones for healthcare education by the bottom of the economic pyramid in the rural regions of LMICs. The motivation for this research came from looking at the ripe Kenyan mobile phone landscape which, according to the Communications Authority of Kenya, December 2021 report, the mobile phone subscription stood at 133.6%. Such a high rate of mobile phone adoption by the Kenyan population is suggestive of a healthy ecosystem for the use of mHealth in the country. However, the empirical evidence on mHealth adoption in Kenyan rural regions has been significantly low. Most of the Kenyan mHealth initiatives were focused only on the technological feasibility, implementation, adoption, usage, and its acceptability. A holistic approach that looked at health behavior change from a health, social, individual, and technological perspectives was lacking. According to the World Health Organization, mHealth is an umbrella term applied in medicine and public health to describe the use of mobile phone technology to provide healthcare by using a mobile phone's core utilities such as voice and text messaging as well as through the internet enabled applications. Kenya, like most of the sub-Saharan African countries, has been battling with a two-pronged burden of both chronic and infectious diseases. Some of the chronic diseases being cancer, diabetes, hypertension, obesity and heart disease, which are primarily attributed to several interrelated factors such as globalization, urbanization, lifestyle change, and high poverty level. Chronic diseases result in dire health consequences, often requiring long-standing treatment and care, causing increased suffering and poverty levels for the patients and their caregivers. However, all is not lost, and the good news is that these diseases are known to be preventable through diet and lifestyle changes. Thus, it is paramount that the rural population be educated on these health behavior changes. Over 70% of the population resides in the country's rural regions, with the com common malaise of poor infrastructure, low levels of health literacy, 
insufficient and inequitable access to healthcare facilities, a shortage of trained healthcare professionals, low socioeconomic status, and the associated high disease burden. To disseminate healthcare information in these regions with a widespread rural population, mHealth has the potential to act as a complementary strategy for strengthening such inadequate healthcare system. This slide presents the research objectives of this study, which were to review literature on the theories of technology adoption and health behavior change, to develop a theoretical framework with individual, social, health, and technology factors. Finally, to recommend a group of resultant factors that could influence mHealth adoption for chronic diseases health literacy in rural Kenya. Nine theories and models from diverse behavioral change disciplines were assessed, namely social norms theory, social cognitive theory, theory of reasoned action, theory of planned behavior, diffusion of innovation theory, technology acceptance model, unified theory of acceptance and use of technology, health action process approach, and health belief model. An integrated multi-theory framework for mHealth use in education and awareness of chronic diseases in rural Kenya was developed after studying the building blocks of each and assessing their strengths and weaknesses. This slide provides a representation of the theoretical framework, the veracity of which was tested in the field. The main dependent variable in this framework was mobile phone adoption. It was being tested directly through the intention to use mobile phones. All the other independent variables were cumulatively measuring the intent to use mobile phones. The technological factors considered in this framework were perceived usefulness and use of mobile phones. Both these factors were conceived to affect the intention to use mobile phones. The health behavior factors extracted from the theories and models were perceived severity to and perceived susceptibility of chronic diseases. Both health behavior factors were believed to have an influence on the perception of the usefulness and the ease of use of mobile phones. Social influence from the peers and the significant others of the community was believed to affect both the perceived usefulness and the perceived ease of use of mobile phones, as well as the intention to use mobile phones. The individual factors that were to be measured were age and language literacy. Age was believed to have an influence on the perceived ease of use of mobile phones, whereas language literacy was conceptualized to have an influence on the perceived ease of use and the perceived usefulness of mobile phones, respectively. This slide presents the research approach that was followed in this paper. The study area was selected through a purposive sampling technique. The study was conducted in Homa Bay County, in Western Kenya. As per the Kenyan Ministry of Health, in 2020, Homa Bay was one of the 47 counties with the highest prevalence of HIV AIDS. Close to 10% of its population was HIV AIDS positive. AIDS is known to be a precursor to an increased risk of chronic diseases due to stimulation of inflammatory markers and adverse effects linked to the antiretroviral medicines of HIV AIDS treatment. The risk of cervical cancer and cardiovascular disease among women living with HIV AIDS is five times higher than those without it. The prevalence of other chronic diseases is also high in Homa Bay County. The exact study site was near total sub-located remoteness, vastness, very poor infrastructure, high poverty levels and an acute lack of accessibility to healthcare facilities and health personnel. This made the study site a good representation of the intended rural poor region of Kenya. The study applied quantitative research methods. A survey questionnaire was developed using five scale Likert type closed form of questions. Mm -hmm. This was purposed to allow minimal human error by the respondents as well as when transcribing the responses. The questionnaire was originally written in English. It underwent a pilot test by the health experts whose feedback gave rise to the first revision. This was then tested by a small study site who suggested 
that the questionnaire should be translated in their local dialect, which is Dholu. It was subsequently translated in the Dholu language. The questionnaire had a section dedicated to each of the independent variables mentioned in the earlier section. Each of the sections had seven questions testing the veracity of the conceived influence on the dependent variable. The questionnaire was administered on a sample population initially calculated to be 11.5% of the total population of the study site, making it 239 participants. However, the actual data collection exercise gathered 315 responses. For data analysis purposes, analysis of moment structures, that is AMOS, for structural equation modeling, SCM, was used. The choice of SCM was made because it has been used in previous psychological studies to determine and to predict behavioral change among individuals. SCM has used to test a model against empirical data by simultaneously analyzing the observed and latent variables to find possible relationships and patterns among them. The following two slides present the primary results of this study. One of the main outcomes was that the intention to use mobile phones was found not to influence the actual mobile phone adoption for healthcare literacy. It was the perceived ease of use of mHealth technology that directly influenced the uptake of mobile phones. Perceived severity of and the susceptibility to chronic diseases led to the belief of mobile phone benefits or their perceived usefulness. Social influence impacted the user's belief towards mobile phones' ease of use. The language used for healthcare literacy through mobile phones PDF was a significant and predictor what? of their adoption through the influence on both their usefulness and the ease of use. The younger users were more receptive of mobile phone adoption, thus demonstrating the impact of age on the adoption of mobile phones for health literacy. As a conclusion of this study, the authors noted that mHealth should be considered as a unique case of technology adoption which is not dependent on technological factors alone, but has a cumulative effect of individual, social, health, and technology factors. This conclusion fulfilled the research objective that was meant to assess the impact of these holistic factors on the mobile phone adoption for healthcare literacy for chronic diseases. The authors further recommended that the stakeholders like technology providers healthcare providers, the government, and funding partners all need to work in tandem for the sustainability of mHealth projects in rural regions to combat chronic diseases. The government should spearhead and support mHealth adoption research, thus enabling the availability of empirical evidence for future decision making. I hope this presentation brought to light that for mHealth to be widely adopted by the rural poor populations, all stakeholders should collaborate to develop consumer-centric solutions which incorporate individual, social, health, as well as technology perspectives. They also need to accept the fact that an intention to change behavior is not always tantamount to the actual behavior change. Once again, I thank you all for attending this presentation. Asante Sana. Thanks very much, Anirudha. Um, can you uh, talk a little about the reasons why you think there is a disconnect potentially between um, these two scenarios? Is it a question of resources that the people don't have the resources to use mobile phones? Or what do you think is the key determining factor? Okay, thank you. If I followed your question correctly, you said that there is a disconnect between having mobile phones and not being used for mHealth. So the specific region that I'm talking about, that is the rural uh, Kenya, the people who have mobile phones have the feature phones, do not have any connection to the internet. Now, it is up to the providers to take healthcare literacy to them in the context and in the form that these consumers can receive it. So if they were to take it, let's say, as an information system, 
if they were to take it as an mHealth app, the consumers will not really be able to receive anything. So according to me, the major disconnect is that whichever initiatives have taken place, one, they have been donor funded. So they do not really, they are not sustainable. Number two, the context of the rural Kenya has really not been taken care of. The language, like I said, that one of the outcomes was that the language of literacy messages, information that's coming to the consumer is paramount. That has also not been taken care of. So these are some of the reasons I can say have led to the disconnect. Thank you. Um, uh, there's a question from Moses, which I'm going to share in chat. Moses, um, can you unmute yourself? Yes, I can. Uh, good Please morning. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you for a good presentation. I hope I'm clearly audible. Yeah, um, we can hear you. My question is, could it be that these mHealth solutions are not as effective as intended, uh, thus impacting their acceptance by healthcare practitioners? Could it be a trust issue? Because network availability is something that is now commonplace. Uh, mobile phones are commonplace. Could it be a trust issue? You probably want to consider, do we trust them? Do they actually deliver? Maybe that's my question before we uh, involve everyone else. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moses. What I have to say here is that specifically my research was targeting uh, on the consumers, and that means it is the rural communities. So we were really not going to the health practitioners because yes, uh, health practitioners, like you said, trust could be definitely there. Uh, lack of skills is also possible. And this is only because of the observation during data collection that I'm now bringing it to you. Uh, though it was not one of the research objectives of this paper. Uh, when you say network, there are places where we still have just 2G network being used. There are very remote uh, spaces, regions, where even the local transport is very difficult to reach. So that is where I'm coming from. These are the consumers that I'm representing in my research. Hoping that I have answered your question. Thank you very much. And then Ambrose, you have a question. Okay, thank you, uh, Madam, for your presentation. Uh, my name is Ambrose uh, from Uganda. I work with uh, Atomic Energy Council. Uh, my question is, um, what can be done to, to change the culture and mindset of uh, the community, the people in the community to embrace ML? Uh, you know that uh, people are reluctant to change People take long to change because some still believe that the, the ML may not be effective. And also um, the, the culture is not yet being embraced. It's not yet a norm to many African communities. And also the technology itself. Some people still don't trust the technology. They don't trust that uh, uh, technology can help them and deliver the services they want. So, uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Ambrose. To answer your question, yes, the culture and mindset definitely adoption of mHealth. It is the African consumer, our consumer here. Um, the providers of mHealth really do need to consider what is make them either adopt or reject. And in my case, in my observation, I have seen the social influence that is provided by the leaders. The peers could be um, the community leaders, could be the religious leaders, etc. If we really want an impact, we need to go through them because it is their voice that reaches the community. Secondly, it is the community health uh, workers. The health personnel really don't reach, to, uh, reach up to the community level, but the go between the community health workers are there. So if they were trained, if the uh, community leaders, if the religious leaders, if we could get a go ahead by them, then I am sure the local Wanainchi or the local public in the rural areas would be able to adopt and health. That is my take for you. Thank you very much. Martin, you had a comment or a question. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a comment and a question as well. Uh, I, I'm sure you're able to hear me. Uh, in the presentation, I did make, I did hear you talk about uh, uh, using, choosing the sample from a community with uh, that has, uh, that is a, Po po poor in nature or poverty in, poverty is in, uh, in that area could be a bit high. And the language they speak, I did, you mentioned about the Dulu, Dulu language. Uh, considering that uh, most mobile or M, M health apps actually come in uh, mostly in English. The question I wanted to verify from the presenter was the mobile apps that was uh, studied in this case, were they in English or they, they were in the Dulu app? And if they were in English, considering that uh, the poor background of that uh, chosen for a uh, sample of population, couldn't that have had an impact in terms of the adoption, considering that these things are in English? But if literacy rate there was a bit low, considering the background of that, probably that could have also been an effect. So maybe as part of the recommendations, if, the, if you could consider uh, the possibility of mobile phone app developers, considering uh, adding the possibility of uh, language translation. So those who cannot uh, uh, maybe uh, communicate in English, they could equally press on that translation button to still be able to use the M Health. Uh, because if it's not in the language they're able to interact with it, then it could also be affecting it. Maybe if you could clarify that what you use, was it in English or the apps that you actually used in conducting this, or was it in the Dolo language? And if not, maybe if you could consider that to your recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Moses. It's an absolutely valid point that you have raised. Um, so this is what I have to say. One, uh, the theoretical framework that was developed and later tested in the uh, field, it did see that language literacy, that is the context of the local language, definitely does impact the adoption or rejection of any M Health initiative may it be in terms of the apps that we are talking about. Although in my case, we were suggesting it should be as a text message because um, the internet connectivity is almost, well, I wouldn't say poor, it is just non-existent in the region where I have gone to collect the data. So we have suggested that it should be through SMS. When it is SMS, surely the translation is possible and it really does need to, and this is what even the consumer has said, that they do need health literacy, but in the language and in the context of their existence there. So this is what I have. But if I missed out on it, uh, something, kindly do raise it up because you have a very valid point here. All right, thank you. And then just my last question. You spoke about, I saw age in the theoretical framework, but in your conclusion, I didn't see how that was maybe made use of in the population itself. How, what effect age actually had on the uptake of the um, of, uh, or mobile, uh, or I think you spoke about text, the USSD or text that you use. Age, what impact age? I don't, I don't know whether maybe you did it in your work, but they didn't put it in the presentation where it was not taken care of. Either. Okay, so yes, age was also a factor that was tested, and it was proved that age does matter. The younger generation adopts mobile phones or any other technology at a much easier and faster rate than the older population. Um, and because of urbanization, most of the population living in these rural areas is the older population because the younger ones have gone out of the remote areas to the towns and city centers to earn a living. So uh, for the population of the rural areas, specifically from where we collected data, yes, age does matter. The older population takes much longer to receive and to adopt uh, any technology. However, in our case, because it is mobile phone text, almost everybody there is very used to one voice feature. Secondly, the SMS feature on the mobile. Mobile money is something which is very popular in our country, Kenya. So almost every uh, individual in that population knows how to, read it, uh, how to use a text message to send or receive M PESA, which is mobile money. By virtue of that, mobile text messages would be the right channel to take health literacy to this population. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was a very good discussion. Thank you very much, Anur Jack. Um, so our next presentation is by Thank Dillies, you. and she's going to be talking about uh, strategic priority factors um, uh, 
if for e-health policies in four African countries. My name is Dilis Labi, and I'll be presenting our paper on assessing strategic priority factors in e-health policies of four African countries. I am a PhD candidate at the Norwegian Centre for e-health research, a department of the University Hospital of North Norway, and UIT, the Arctic University of Norway, both in Tromsø, Norway. I am a trained medical laboratory scientist with a master's in public health and also telemedicine and e-health. This paper presents the results of a review for the Better e-health project, an EU-funded project that aims to support the deployment of e-health in African low and lower middle income countries. Multiple studies have established that there is an association between the use of e-health and improved health outcomes. African countries have experienced rapid growth in the area of e-health in recent years. However, there appears to be a lack of governance in relation to e-health systems in the low and lower middle income countries. In addition to national e-health strategies that form the basis of e-health initiatives because they govern, prioritize, monitor and evaluate these initiatives, robust governance mechanisms are essential to achieving a sustainable e-health environment. Studies have suggested that successful development and deployment of e-health require long-term national legislative and physical planning, which represent public policy factors, sufficient technical infrastructure, which represents technical factors, and ICT literacy among healthcare staff, which represents human factors. The Better eHealth project considers public policy, technical and human factors as eHealth strategic priority factors and advocates for applying a holistic approach to e-health by addressing these factors. The objective of this study was to analyze and assess the strategic priority factors in the e-health policies of Ethiopia, Ghana, Malawi and Tunisia. These four countries are better e-health project partners and the focal points for the better e-health African regional hub, that is Ethiopia for the eastern and central regional hub, Ghana for the western regional hub, Malawi for the Southern Regional Hub, and Tunisia for the Northern Regional Hub. The four countries have e-health strategies or ICT or health policy documents. The official national e-health policy documents, however, vary substantially in scope and coverage. Assessing national policy documents and e-health strategies can yield valuable input to policy roadmap processes in low and lower middle income countries. It can also promote a more systematic approach to the planning, development and implementation of e-health in these countries. To achieve the study objective, we used a document analysis design complemented by adaptive qualitative content analysis. Content analysis involves the subjective interpretation of text data through a systematic identification and coding of themes. Given the heterogeneity of the content of the policy documents, this method was the most appropriate. The primary data source was national e-health policy documents. We also used health or technology related policy documents in the absence of a national e-health policy document. Data extraction was conducted from October to November 2021. Using the World Health Organization and International Telecommunication Union's e-health strategy toolkit as a guide, data was extracted from relevant documents. The toolkit comprises seven components representing key e-health building blocks. These are leadership and governance, strategy and investment, services and applications, infrastructure, standards and interoperability, legislation, policy and compliance, and workforce. The available documents did not have information on most of the questions under the seven components, so we regrouped the data according to the three better e-health factors public policy factors, technical factors, and human factors. We then summarize the findings from the documents for each of the four countries. Ethiopia, Ghana, and Malawi have official national e-health policy documents, but the documents for Ethiopia and Ghana are outdated. Health or ICT policy documents were used in addition to these documents. Tunisia has no official national e-health policy document. So health or ICT policy documents were used in the absence of an official e-health policy document. The results are information available in these documents, even if they were outdated. With regards to the public policy factors, for all four countries, the ministries of health, 
or departments in the ministry are responsible for health strategy and planning, and therefore they are responsible for e-health. In Ethiopia, the Federal Ministry of Health has established the Warida Net System to ensure internet connectivity and e-health services at both the regional and district, which is also known as Warida levels. The focus of e-health policies are on improving standardization, establishing proper infrastructure, and building capacity among both management and healthcare workers. In Ghana, there is no coordinating body or framework for investments in e-health infrastructure. The strategies and the policies focus on streamlining regulatory framework, capacity building, and improving health information technology infrastructure. In Malawi, Policy strategies are to ensure availability of high quality data, capacity building, and aligning investments and financing in e-health. In Tunisia, critical policy areas include improving health information systems and electronic health records, data protection, and reducing the divide between rural and urban areas with regards to digital health access. With regards to the technical factors, for all four countries, the implemented e-health systems are silos, that is, they are small-scale isolated efforts. There is also a lack of interoperability between e-health systems and subsystems. In Ethiopia, improved interoperability will be ensured through applications guidelines, unique identifiers, facility master lists, and a national health data dictionary. In Ghana, to improve interoperability and integration of data, a national information technology agency has been appointed as part of the Ministry of Communication. The agency has developed an interoperability framework for this purpose. Additionally, increased systematic efforts are being made to ensure that health solutions comply with the national technical standards policies and regulations. In Malawi, Alternative energy sources like the use of solar energy for vaccination refrigerators are being tested to supplement the power source for health systems due to constant and prolonged power interruptions. National ID cards that will be able to store health information in the future have been implemented for citizens aged 16 years and above. In Tunisia, efforts are being made to upgrade and modernize hospital information systems and develop innovative telemedicine projects to connect all levels of care. For the human factors, in Ethiopia, there is a scarcity of health information system personnel and healthcare personnel. There exist, however, undergraduate and graduate programs in health informatics at universities and colleges. In Ghana, there is a lack of health staff with adequate skill sets in both e-health and ICT. The only health sector program that focuses on ICT to some degree is a diploma program offered at the Rural Health Training School. In Malawi, there is a significant lack of competent staff with adequate skills in digital health systems. So although more healthcare workers continue to have access to computing devices, connectivity and digital health systems, these systems are highly underutilized. There are, however, public and private universities and colleges that offer training programs in informatics and other health ICT courses. In Tunisia, healthcare providers lack recognized skills in health information systems. The governments of Ethiopia, Ghana, Malawi and Tunisia appear committed to cultivating their e-health environment, which could be a means of improving health coverage in these low resource countries. However, Achieving a thriving e-health environment requires more capacity building within the health sector, which was lacking in all four countries. To ensure that both foreign and domestic investments in e-health are maximized, policies must be updated regularly to reflect a country's true e-health status. E-health governing bodies need to secure long-term funding for sustainability of e-health initiatives. Digital registries can be created to summarize a country's e-health initiatives and priority areas to create opportunities for strategic collaboration between the international community and low and lower middle income countries in terms of knowledge sharing and research in e-health. In conclusion, addressing the public policy, technical and human factors in national e-health policy development will produce a more comprehensive policy to guide successful e-health deployment in low resource countries. In addition, Involving a variety of stakeholders, including patients and healthcare professionals in policy development will help produce a user-centric, 
country-specific and effective e-health policy. Thank you very much for your attention. For further information, please contact me by sending an email to dulles.labi at ehealthresearch.no or to the Better eHealth Project, info at betterehealth.eu. Dilly, thank you very much. That was a very interesting presentation. Um, my colleague Miriam and I have experience working in the health field in Ethiopia and Malawi, so we could relate to a lot of what you were talking about. Could we talk um, maybe specifically about uh, three interrelated challenges, siloed solutions, interoperability, and human factors? Um, so presumably the siloed solutions is partly due to lack of coordination and also resource issues, but would you like to comment on any one of those three issues? Thank you. Um, thank you very much. So um, with the silos, um, it's, I guess, um, because there's no governing, we don't, the countries do not have um, governing structures for e-health. They, most of these um, projects just um, are individual projects, pilot studies that um, are taking place in the countries. And therefore they are not, um, they, they end up being um, individual or single um, projects that are not interconnected to, with the other systems in the, in the countries. So in, in, in order to, maybe prevent all of these silos, um, it would be best to have a governance structure for the um, for e-health in each country so that these um, structures um, determine how and what um, projects can be, can be um, done in the countries and make sure they are, all the projects are kind of interrelated and also, um, yeah. They, they, there's some sort of interoperability in relation to um, the projects as well. So that systems being developed are connected to each other in some way in the e-health um, environment. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think one of the key tools um, to address some of these challenges are the e-health working groups that many countries have set up. So in Uganda, for example, that's a very well-established model. Um, years ago, they had problems with um, unilaterally research just turning up in Uganda doing e-health projects. And then there was greater coordination with governmental bodies. And partly as a result of that, the Ministry of Health established an e-health working group where all the different key stakeholders got together. And there was like some sort of a filtering process by which um, analysis was done prior to a new intervention taking place. So while you know, the circumstances in all countries is different and therefore the paths that they need to follow may vary according to their circumstances. I think here health working groups and that kind of stakeholder engagement is critically important. Um, Jay, you have a comment. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the presentation. I think it was a good presentation. I think this issue of uh, national policy on here is, is a common because I think the case of Cameroon we have so many uh <coughs> solution with the ACC the same solution and they're all they are all operating in, in silo. I think this issue can be addressed at national level it's, it's, a, it's a political way that needs to be addressed at the level of the parliament to come out with the policy in case and again, besides that if we look of the regional level maybe at the CIMAC at the ECOWAS and so on this is going to be, it can be pushed at that level, I think it will be very useful. Yeah, thank you for your, your suggestion. Yeah, um, I didn't really hear a question, but I think you were making a suggestion, contribution. Yes, thank you very much. And Moses, do you want to share your question? Yes, yes, I can. Um, just uh, thank you very much for a very, very interesting 
uh, presentation there on the issue of e-health policies. And my question probably for further inquiry is how is the level of implementation or development of these policies correlated to health outcomes? For example, are we seeing in countries where e-health policies are implemented, are we seeing lower incidences of certain uh, diseases? Are we seeing better data collection, uh, better view of, of, of the situation on the ground? What exactly are we seeing as a result of the policies either being in place or being implemented? If you've not looked at it, probably that'd be a nice thing to do as, as a continuation to your study. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Moses. Um, that was really not one of um, the objectives of the study. We were just um, reviewing the documents to see what um, the countries have done so far and what they intend to do um, at the time of the policy, um, the e-health policy development. So thank you for your suggestion and we would take that into consideration for the next study. And Felix, you're going to be the last comment. Can you unmute yourself? Hello. Yes. Thank you for the nice presentation. I, I think I missed a component. Uh, first of all, thank you for the nice presentation and time we study, but I think I missed why the, the countries that you have selected, uh, what were the factors considered in selecting the countries like Ethiopia, Ghana, Malawi, and Tunisia. But the other aspect which I wanted to know is whether you considered exploring uh, adoption of emerging technologies in these strategies, where the strategies updated uh, to take on board these emerging technologies like artificial intelligence, machine learning, and the likes. Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. Um, with regards to the selection of the countries, we um, we selected these four countries because they are partners in the, pro in the um, EU funded projects that we are working on. And um, yeah, so we decided to focus on them because we they are partners and we had information, we had people who could give us information from the countries if we didn't have any available or official e-health policy documents. Um, with regards to looking at the um, emerging technologies, if they were in the documents, we would have, um, mentioned it because we just took information that we had in the documents and since some of most of the documents were kind of outdated i think at that time they didn't have any much information or much a uh, lot of technologies on um, artificial intelligence um, big data and stuff like that so we we did take the information from the documents and we didn't see a lot of these um, artificial intelligence or big data either the policies do not report it or um, they haven't done anything in relation to that yet. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Very Thank much. you for the, for the answers. Answers fine. Uh, thank you very much, Julie. That was a very interesting um, research and I look forward to future collaboration. So our next um, presentation from Tunisia um, is focused on strategic partnerships in e-health in low and lower middle income countries in Africa. In the same project. And this is from the same project as I understand it. Research from the Health Tech Cluster Tunisia, which is a scientific association that promotes the use and exploitation of technologies in the health sector. And today I will present uh, my study entitled Strategic Partnerships in e-health in low and lower middle income countries in Africa. So the present study is designed under the Better e-health project framework, which studies the human, technical and political factors for better coordination and support of e-health in low and lower middle countries in Africa. It is an RNI project funded by the European Commission under the Horizon 2020 framework and involves uh, six European partners and five African partners. The main objective of the project is to contribute to a better health and more accessible and efficient care services in African countries by e-health solutions deployment. Uh, 
as e-health is an interdisciplinary area, collaboration and partnerships at local and international levels are crucial, particularly in low and lower middle countries. Partnerships with international funding bodies or corporate cooperation organization uh, can provide financial resources, technical expertise and networking. For the purpose of this study, partnership refers to a group of organizations with a common interest that agree to work together toward a common goal. To make sure that partnerships create added value for the involved parties, it is important that they are formed strategically based on strategic objectives and working program. And the combination of the terms partnership and strategic introduces a, questions, a question of priorities in the implementation of joint actions. Our study aims to first identify strategic partnerships in low and lower middle countries in Africa, and second, analyze their potential and lacking aspects to be improved in the better e-health project next activities. So in order to build the basis for cooperation and deployment of eHealth through the next uh, project activities, the following methodology was designed. The first activity is to map existing partnerships, then contact with existing partnership to collect relevant information, and then the evaluation phase to select strategic ones. According to the Better eHealth project methodology, and in order to identify existing partnerships in uh, low and lower middle countries in Africa, four regional hubs covering the different regions uh, are established. Tunisia represents North Africa, Ghana represents East Africa, the Central Western Africa hub is based in Ethiopia, and the Southern Africa hub is based in Malawi. Data collection has been performed in the four participating countries to identify existing partnerships at the national and international levels. The procedure for this activity consisted in a desk web research including reports, press articles and other GREE literature sources, like government documents and funding organizations' reports, to present partnerships' baseline characteristics like uh, involved partners, duration of the partnership, its objective and other uh, information. The second phase of data collection consisted in making interviews and online forms with partners to seek criteria evaluation based on questions and gu guiding notes from the developed partnership assessment tool. A partnership assessment tool has been developed to evaluate the different aspects of partnerships and select strategic ones. In relation to the Better eHealth framework, the tool is tailored to measure key performance indicators of e-health partnerships. The developed PAT comprises four main elements, evaluation criteria, guiding notes, assessment questions, and evaluation ranging from very low, which is equal to one point out of five, to very high, which is equal to five points. Ten criteria were adopted to assess whether a partnership is successful or not, one, ownership, two, inclusive approach, three, clearly agreed responsibility and a strong commitment, four, sufficient and shared resources and exchange information, five, equity, six, good practice in management and transparency of decision making, seven, clearly defined the working program, eight, good relationship and efficient communication, nine, planned and leveraged external relations, and ten, monitoring and evaluation. And six criteria to assess strategic partnerships. One, clearly formulated strategic objectives. Two, sustainability. Three, resilience. Four, ability for growth. Five, support of innovation. And six, support of exchanging best practices. Finally, the partnership is considered strategic if its total score uh, is equal to or greater than 3.5 uh, out of 5. Following data collection, 15 partnerships have been identified. Their assessment resulted in 11 strategic ones uh, distributed as follows. Three partnerships from Ethiopia, three from Ghana, three from, Mal from Malawi, and two from Tunisia. Among uh, the evaluated strategic criteria of partnerships, ET1 from Ethiopia, Support of innovation has been assigned the least score that is equal to 3 out of 5. 
for partnership ET2, resilience and ability for growth is evaluated the lowest with a score equal to 3.5. Finally, within partnership ET3, ability for growth has achieved the least score, uh, which is equal to 3. In Ghana, all the strategic criteria of partnerships GH1 and GH3 involving international organizations have achieved a score equal or superior to 4. For partnership GH2 involving national actors, all the evaluated strategic criteria achieved a score equal or superior to 4, except for sustainability that was assigned a grade equal to 3.25. Uh, In Malawi, support in, of innovation has been rated as low, followed by sustainability with a grade equal to, to 2.5 for partnership MW1. For partnership MW2, sustainability has been uh, assessed the lowest with a grade equal to 3, while for partnership uh, MW3, all the strategic criteria achieved a high score except for sustainability that was assigned a low score equal to 2.5. For partnership TN1 in Tunisia, among the different criteria, sustainability and ability for growth had achieved the lowest grade. Partnership TN2 has achieved a score equal to uh, 3.44, which is close to the predefined threshold, and thus can be considered as a strategic partnership if certain aspects will be enhanced, in particular sustainability, that again was assessed the lowest. Based on the performed evaluation in the four African countries, sustainability had uh, the lowest score for five partnerships, with, which represents 45% of partnerships. Ability for growth had the lowest score for three partnerships, i.e. 25% of partnerships, followed by support of innovation that has been rated the lowest for two partnerships that represent 18%. Results analysis shows that uh, almost all the strategic partnerships involve international funding organization. It can be the WHO, a development cooperation body like the European Union, the FDA, the GIZ or KOFIH, or an academic institution like University of Oslo or University of Southeastern Norway. Contrarywise, only partnership GH2 from Ghana represents a national partnership that is funded by the Ghana Ministry of Health amongst all identified strategic partnerships. It is also noticed that no African-African uh, partnership was identified. These findings show a lack of national and African cooperation in e-health deployment. Findings analysis show, uh, shows that certain aspects, mainly sustainability, ability for growth and support of innovation, have to be enhanced to guarantee the impact of partnerships after the ending of its actions. Obtained results also demonstrate uh, the lack of national cooperation and governmental support in financing e-health projects which represent a challenge for its development in the studied countries. Based on the findings, it is recommended that policymakers increase their support by creating funding mechanisms and revising the regulatory framework to support partnership sustainability. It is also recommended that existing partnerships plan their long-term objectives and strategy and boost innovation activities to guarantee their ability for growth. In the upcoming Better eHealth project activities, strategic partners, partners along with other key actors in eHealth will be involved to prepare a strategic policy roadmap for eHealth development. That's all and thank you for your attention. Thanks, Rehan. How important a factor do you think um, it is that there's fragmentation of funding, which also explains why there's such a siloed and, and low coordination approach to e-health interventions at national levels in Africa, let alone at a pan-African level? Thanks. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for this opportunity. So um, as our results uh, show, like there is lack of national and uh, governmental support for 
uh, strategic or even um, any kind of existing partnership in e-health. Uh, and this is considered as uh, an inhibiting factor to the development of the um, e-health e -health corporations and um, partnerships at the national or African-African level. So uh, the study partnerships or the existing partnerships depend uh, strongly on the international uh, like uh, financing and funding, uh, which hinder like the sustainability of the impact uh, of those partnerships like the results shows. So uh, sustainability and ability uh, for growth are uh, the, the main two uh, criteria that were uh, the least evaluated. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I think realistically, the best way of trying to encourage African African partnerships is to fund cross border interventions. In other words, I think the days of doing a siloed approach where you do something in one country, it may be easier, it may be lower risk, but in terms of impact, I think there are significant deficits. Thank you very much for your contribution. So our next presentation is from Chipo Malawi, who's going to talk about a communities of practice. Good morning, uh, my name is Chipo Kanjo. This morning, I'll be presenting to you a paper titled Community of Practice in Practice, Successful Implementation of Integrated Community Health Information Systems. In short, I'll be calling this ICIS. Uh, the paper has been co-authored with my colleagues, uh, Chuonge, Rorins, Ahmed, and Ondwane. Uh, for a long time, the Malawi health sector community level was using paper-based tools. Uh, and when digital tools were introduced, most of them were only addressing a, either a single functionality or a single program, resulting with a lot of fragmentation in siloed systems. Uh, the diagrams here illustrate uh, the volume of paper for the paper-based tools and also a mobile app which only addresses one program, which is TB. They saw a need to develop an integrated community health information system with integrated service delivery, standardized guidance on clinical decision making, uh, managing longitudinal health data records, and providing mid level access to data also providing patient level data analytics and ensuring system interoperability. The diagram on the uh, left illustrates, shows the, the currently developed integrated community health information system. The overall objective for, is to, of the whole uh, initiative is to develop an integrated community health system, incorporating users and relevant stakeholders' needs. And for this paper, the focus is on how the interaction of different communities of practice, which were identified, have led to the successful implementation of the information systems at community level, examining the methods of communication across and within different communities of practice. Uh, participatory approach was used uh, for this initiative through stakeholders' involvement and also user-centered design approach, where at each level, beginning from the first phase uh, to the current phase where we are on deployment, uh, stakeholders have been involved in all the different stages. The research state setting for uh, the initiative is the Malawi health sector and implementation of IKIS is done across the four levels of Malawi health sector, which includes national level, district level, health facility, community. The main implementation area 
here is the community level. Uh, however, although uh, it's focusing on community level, all other levels were also part and parcel of implementation, considering that policy is done at national level. Some of the supervision facilitation involves uh, members of the district and also health facility level. Communities of practice involved in the IKIS implementation were also identified as part of the, the methods for uh, this particular paper. And for the community of practices, we actually identified five the policymakers community of practice, developers community of practice, users community of practice, facilitators and supervisors community of practice. And these communities of practice have been used from inception to deployment. And some of the community of practices were interacting with each other during the different stages of implementation. Uh, we explain how the interactions took place. Beginning with the policy makers community of practice, uh, here interactions were done in meetings, and this would be both physical meetings and uh, virtual meetings. Uh, electronic mails would be exchanged uh, amongst uh, the policy makers. And the activities included uh, planning uh, the implementation uh, from phase one to deployment, budgeting, uh, and also resource allocation for IKIS development uh, and for training and also for supervision. Reports, reporting, where uh, the reports submitted by the technical support team, which is uh, University of uh, Malawi, would also be discussed amongst the policy makers and uh, identify the areas which need uh, more attention and so on and so forth. It also involved issues pertaining to quality control and negotiating for more funding and support from other uh, potential interested uh, partners. Policymakers COP included uh, members from uh, the Ministry of Health, Digital Health Department, Monitoring and Evaluation Department, uh, from uh, development partners, uh, also the core team from the University of Malawi, the, the team providing uh, technical support. Another community of practice is that of developers, mainly uh, involving members from the University of Malawi and also members from Digital Health Department and uh, some members from the development partner side uh, who have been dedicated full time joining the, the developers at the University of Malawi uh, to uh, develop IKIS and developers in their community of practice interact through live development DHIS2 instance. And here we have uh, three instances, a development instance, which is used for raw development. And once this has been, uh, has taken shape, it's moved into a test instance, which is used for pre-testing. And uh, following that, once the pre-test uh, it passes, then it's moved into a pilot instance, which is used for deployment. And uh, in this uh, COP, a plethora of uh, online tools are used for group support, interaction, and task allocation. And these tools include uh, Google Sheets and Google Meets. Interactions are also done in meetings and WhatsApp groups. Uh, and an example here in the background is uh, a WhatsApp communication where one of the developers is informing uh, the rest of the team that the development instance has the latest database from test instance. And also uh, they have activities which include task allocation to members of development team and also sharing uh, 
tips on how to rectify errors amongst other things. Another uh, COP is that of users. Here interactions are done at health facility level, in the field, WhatsApp groups, and also they have uh, activities which include sharing notes. Uh, if one learns about new things, they, they share, they share tips, they share issues which they may have encountered in case others may have uh, answers to those uh, challenges. And uh, if they come across some mock arounds, they also share that uh, through the WhatsApp uh, uh, groups. Uh, they also interact when it comes to reporting, just comparing notes to ensure that what is being reported is what is supposed to, uh, in the right format, the way it's supposed to be reported. Facilitators, uh, COP, here in interactions are done in briefing, debriefing sessions, uh, before and after uh, trainings uh, have been conducted. It, they also interact in meetings, both physical and virtual, uh, where they, they, they would uh, plan and they would have sessions for developing training materials uh, do some resource allocation for community register and uh, IGIS training, and also issues pertaining to uh, reporting. This group also does a lot of communication, interaction through emails and uh, WhatsApp, WhatsApp groups. Uh, the last uh, COP is that of supervisors, where in, again, interactions are done in briefing, the, the briefing sessions meetings, both physical and virtual, electronic mails uh, with uh, activities, including planning of uh, the supervision, where to supervise, uh, the checklist, what they should look out for, and uh, also they interact through field sessions where they visit community health workers in action as they visit the different household it reports and also through monitoring and evaluation activities. I mentioned earlier that there is interrelations between COPs. You find that policy makers and facilitators COP would interact mostly because of commonalities in the members of these uh, different COPs and also largely because uh, issues pertaining to funding of facilitation uh, or involves uh, policy makers. So there would be a lot of uh, interactions uh, across the or between the different COPs. Similarly, developers and facilitators uh, COP interact a lot. Um, most, almost all the developers will constitute uh, part of the facilitation team because uh, this enables uh, rectification of uh, issues, bugs as uh, facilitation is taking place and the users are trying to practice on how to use the, the IKIS app. Uh, facilitators and supervisors also uh, interact a lot because most of the uh, super most of the facilitators would also uh, form the supervision team. We also have interaction between supervisors and users of uh, communities of practice because uh, in the cases whereby both the user and the supervisors would, uh, would form part of uh, the trainees uh, where the facilitators would uh, facilitate to both of them. And then it gets to a point where uh, there is some separation where another, another team, another set has to be trained further as supervisors. So there is a lot of uh, interacting between and across the different uh, communities of practice uh, involved in ICIS development. Uh, in conclusion, the interactions across COP ensure that efforts are not duplicated. 
and this promotes cost effectiveness and is quite beneficial. Uh, communities of practice develop around things that matter to people and their practices reflect the members' own understanding of what is important. From the findings, we noticed that policy, software development, user involvement, training, and supervision matter in IKIS development and implementation. The interrelationships of the communities of practice ensure high throughput through work satisfaction on one hand and continued measurable feedback on the other. And the practical implications of this research focus on the need to have good collaboration amongst all actors involved and affected by a digital solution development and implementation. The collaboration is enhanced through five communities of practice as we've already uh, seen. As such, we can conclude that success takes a balance of forces. What matters is the way different players coordinate and the presence of a continuous evaluation of the system during implementation. Uh, it is not only the technology or the inclusion of the social aspects that leads to successful implementation of an information system, but also continuous human observance. And here we have the list of references which were used for the paper. I uh, thank you, Zikom. Thanks, Chipo. That's a very interesting presentation. Um, so will we start with Moses this time? Chip, Moses? Yeah, Chipo, thank you for your presentation on the issue of communities of practice. I am one who is particularly struggling to develop one, but do you have examples of success? You know, like a tangible example that has succeeded and a few lessons for, for the rest of us, if time allows, I'll appreciate, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Moses. The quite a number of examples uh, looking at the different community of communities of practice, particularly where interaction across the different communities of practice is involved. Currently, actually, we are uh, implementing the the IQ system in one of the districts. Uh, the district where we did the first uh, pilot it was noted that it's not always good for uh, the core development team to be out there uh, facilitating. So that led to the interaction across uh, uh, facilitators, supervisors and users team where uh, the, the, the main development team had to train the district team as uh, train of trainers and this the district team is the one now um, moving around uh, in the health facilities uh, ensuring that everybody is really well based with the system and doing doing the right thing another success is uh, where uh, instead of just uh, narrowing down the development team to those of us providing technical support it's been uh, extended to have uh, a community uh, of practice, a nationwide community of practice, where uh, members from University of Malawi, mem members uh, from DHD, members from CIMED, members from the development partners, not all of them, but they, they give us some technical people who can also be form part of the developers, uh, uh, community of practice. And continuously, we, we have different communities of practice which are quite active, uh, exchanging notes all the time so that whatever issue is noted at one place, uh, immediately it's uh, uh, broadcasted uh, across uh, the, the, all the participating members, uh, mostly via the, the WhatsApp group. So I, I could say those are some of uh, the examples. and. Uh, because of this, it tends to be a, quite a, a good model, both in terms of uh, uh, the, the user, uh, user buy-in and also 
in terms of uh, resource allocation because uh, different uh, people are interacting continuously and being able to know uh, where instead of uh, having duplicated efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Kipo. Uh, Martin and then Ernest. Uh, yeah, uh, Chipo, I wanted to find out uh, concerning the community of practice, uh, whether you considered privacy and security uh, uh, concerns, because what uh, sometimes uh, privacy and security uh, issues comes up when we are integrating systems. For instance, the last presentation we had in terms of a cross-border systems, uh, some of the things that come up are privacy and security. Were this considered in terms of the community of practice and what did you find out if you did? Okay, um, I would say that the, that was not uh, whatever is being uh, discussed within the communities of practices um, are quite uh, public knowledge. Uh, for example, where you have uh, issues pertaining to budgeting, these are confined only to the policymakers uh, community of practice. So maybe there would be certain issues pertaining to negotiations which may not be uh, uh, which may not be uh, required to be uh, passed on to developers or facilitators or supervisors those issues are confined within that community of practice and you ensure that only those uh, legit members who are supposed to be in that community practice are aware of that that's the level of uh, uh, maintaining uh, privacy and confidentiality otherwise mostly most of the issues discussed are for uh, for the you know for general knowledge and for all members in the other communities of practice to be to be aware of. For the users, uh, there would be issues like maybe they're trying to uh, do some uh, action on the app and they, they can't manage to do that. If they feel this should not be broadcasted like in a WhatsApp group, then there are other channels. Uh, the, the phone numbers are available for who they have to reach and they, they do that uh, privately. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Well, thanks, Martin. Ernest, you're up. Uh, good morning, Chief. Um, my name is Ernest from Zambia. Mine is um, a comment based on your presentation, which I think is very educative. Um, it is interesting to note that you are at the level of implementation of uh, a community health information system. Um, we are currently doing similar work here in Zambia. Although yours is looking at uh, the community health information system, ours is looking at a radiology information system that has until now remained non-existent in public health facilities here in Zambia. The second interesting thing is uh, the concept of community of practices, because another work we are trying to embark on is that of uh, seeing uh, the possibility of potential of implementing enterprise medical imaging. You will get to know about this later in my presentation in the day. But uh, looking at uh, how close Malawi is to Zambia and similarities in culture of the people, I think that I would really uh, be glad to get in touch with you so that we could share notes on how you have uh, used your strategies to reach the point of deployment of such systems. Thank you so much. I'll post my, uh, my email address in the chat. Thank you so much, uh, uh, please, please do. And uh, uh, just to quickly mention that this, this came uh, as a result of uh, the strategic plans and also the fact that uh, here in Malawi, we have a model where issues pertaining to what has to be implemented within the health sector currently uh, is uh, being discussed through the different technical working groups. And that has helped a lot because this is where you know who is doing what uh, where 
and if at all there are some duplications. And I should also be quick to say, uh, it's not 100% uh, effective because uh, this is something which we came up with uh, as a way of uh, um, cleaning or sanitizing uh, somewhat used to, to, to exist leading to a a lot of fragmentation and uh, uh, sexually linked from what happened at the other levels, particularly lots and lots of, of uh, EMRs fragmenting, addressing just uh, a single functionality. So for community level, uh, Time, time to put what into action. Uh, thank you. And Thanks, Chief. Yes, please uh, do send your contact, Ernest. Uh, that will be really good. Right, so um, Ambrose, you have a comment. Okay, thank you. Thank you, the presenter. Thank you, the moderator. Um, and thank you for the, the wonderful presentation you have made so far. Um, my question is uh, in regards to acceptance, acceptance of the system. Uh, in your own experience, uh, how was the community acceptance of the system? Did you face uh, some challenges in regards to how people perceive the system? Because sometimes uh, this system comes and uh, people may not uh, by by it, people may think that um, the system or the technology has come to replace replace them, or or they will lose their jobs. So, <laughs> in your experience, did people uh, take it positively or negatively? And um, and in your experience, how was the system? Did people will find it user friendly? Because sometimes these systems come and they are good, but they are not user friendly, and people may not. Uh, use them easily, uh, leading to low acceptance. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Ambrose. Uh, actually, I might say that uh, in our case, we've been lucky, largely because of the, the processes which have uh, happened prior to the uh, implementation of uh, the electronic, the integrated system. Uh, prior to this, uh, the community health uh, section of the Ministry of Health embarked on a project where they integrated all the different functionalities of a community health worker in Malawi manually. So for starters, we have uh, an integrated paper-based system. So uh, we're now moving from there into the electronic system. So for the HSAs, the community health workers, uh, in terms of processes, nothing has changed. They, they can actually see that, okay, we moving away from these heavy registers, which we have to carry door to door on a daily basis to something which is lighter and uh, they don't have to, to rub with rubbers, whatever mistakes they've made. They can, they can also have uh, a good repository of uh, longitudinal data. So already they see a number of advantages. So where we, we saw, we noted some challenges is uh, um, te technically when you're capturing the data for, for household, uh, there's need to have a household head and at the same time include the household head as uh, a person in the person register. So this is uh, one area where the users would always say, why do we have to, to repeat? But after explaining it to them during the, the training sessions, they, they get to understand why that has to, to be done like that. So in a way for them, it's uh, easing the, the wake uh, because the, the integrated registers are, are also quite, quite heavy. Adding on to that, uh, this is something which uh, like I mentioned earlier, it's coming from the national community health strategy. So it hasn't just started 
with the implementation of ICES, and further, which is uh, also uh, an, a, an advantage, uh, this is something which has been also, uh, it has a lot of political will because uh, twice our president has included it in the uh, state of address, uh, national state of address. So with those factors coupled together, plus the fact that it's not just about the, the technical support team, it's about the technical support team, the ministry departments, the, the digital department, the, the department responsible for community, and, and also the development partner, partners working, working together. So where we are today, we're getting more interest from also other development partners. Thank you. Thanks, Chipo. Um, so I just want to briefly um, explore a little bit more the concept of interrelationships of the communities of practice. And I'm particularly mm. interested in exploring the intensity of that interaction. So mm. it's very striking that the facilitators are essentially the thread between the policymakers, the developers, and the supervisors, because you have communities of practice that include both of those. Um, I can understand to a degree why mm. you don't have the facilitator interacting directly with the users. Presumably that's because you don't want to undermine the professional relationship between the supervisors and the users. So could you talk about that issue of trust and relationships and how do you ensure that the data being shared by the supervisors from the users is accurate? Is there any way of doing an internal quality check every so often to make sure that the supervisors aren't either interpreting things um, in an inappropriate way. I'm not suggesting they are, but I'm just trying to manage risk here. And then there's another related issue that I want to follow up with you on. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Paul. And actually the facilitators also interact with users uh, like during, during training, trainings and uh, facilitators also interact with users when they, they, they take the supervision role. So there's so, uh, a num there are a number of ways where the facilitators are also interacting with the users, uh, both directly and uh, in indirectly. Uh, moving on to to the to the issue of trust facilitators. Uh, also part of the the policy situation where uh, within the Unima team. Uh, three uh, of the members also form part of the, the, the policy team. So in this case, three members from the, uh, uh, the facilitators team or from University of Malawi would, would also form part of uh, uh, the, the, the policy team, be it negotiation for funding, uh, coming up with budgets, planning activities, uh, they, they, would, they would also participate in, in, in that. So, and, and that's independent of uh, the rest of the activities. And then in turn, uh, these, these three would also uh, interact with uh, the other communities of, of practice. So if we were to take, uh, if I was to have a Venn diagram and indicate how the different communities of practice interact, you'd find that uh, the three uh, members I mentioned here interact in all, uh, are part of all the other uh, communities of practice except the user's community of, of practice. And that those are like the ones uh, having a uh, central or, overlapping uh, presence in, in all the, the different communities of practice. And when we get to facilitators, you also find that the, the, the facilitators uh, would play a role uh, whereby not only would they train the, the supervisors and let them go, they would, they would train them and then supervise the supervisors 
until a point where uh, the supervisors are confident enough to do it alone. Uh, that, that, that's the, the, the processes which are being used currently. So they would be supervising and it gets to a time where the, the members of the facilitation team would also visit this, both the supervisors and the users to ensure that uh, things are moving on uh, correctly. And uh, some of uh, this monitoring would be done electronically by cross-checking what uh, would have been captured into the, the system. Thank you. Thanks, Chipo. So in other words, the University of Malawi is that thread that goes through all of them. So then the other related issue that I wanted you to briefly explore for us is intensity of interaction, because presumably there's been lessons learned over the last number of years in terms of an optimal level of intensity, or maybe where there should be more intensity at different stages of a new process or something like that. So can you talk us through how you optimized the level of intensity of the activities of the different COPs so that you're not overloading people, particularly at the user end, but at the same time you're consulting with them enough and they're having uh, yeah. that stimulation? Yeah, in terms of the, the intensity, intensity is um, done uh, when we are uh, doing it for the first time, deploying, uh, not only do they go, the users go through the ICIS, but they, they go through side by side the, the paper-based, the integrated community register, and also the uh, integrated community health information system. So they'll start with the register, and day one will do the register. Day two, uh, do half day, do part of the, the practical aspects of the register, give them case studies, uh, let them fill the registers. And from there, we move on to introducing the, the uh, IKIS app, uh, let them uh, learn about how to use it. And then we move on to the uh, implementing, actual, actually picking what they've captured in the register and transfer it into the C, the relationship between what they would otherwise have captured manually uh, with what they are capturing electronically. And following that, uh, because this is using case studies, we move on to the field. I let them capture the information in their, you know, in their catchment areas. And then the next day you follow them up and see whether what they capture in the app is, is correct. And you give it uh, a month and then go back and uh, check whether they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. So in terms of intensity, intensity is there indeed at the very first uh, uh, training. Thank you. Thanks, Deepa, that's very useful. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone for a very participatory session, and I'd like to thank all of the presenters for sharing some excellent insights and for answering questions so well. Um, we're going to take a short break, and we're going to start again on the half hour. Um, and um, I wish you all uh, a pleasant break. Gurmila Mahagat Slangafoil.